once upon a time. During my first year of law school, I volunteered as a court-appointed special advocate, monitoring kids who had been abused or neglected at home. And during our training sessions, the director of our program said to us, this is not a soup kitchen. At soup kitchens, you get to help people in a very clear-cut way. You provide food for the hungry, and at the end of the day, your feet may hurt and your shoulders may be tired, but you get to feel good about yourself. And you deserve to, because that is a noble and worthy way to spend your time. In this program, I will ask you to walk into grim, awful places and make recommendations which may result in a child being taken away from her parents or returned to a violent home because it's less damaging for children to experience some abuse than to be separated from their parents entirely. You deserve to feel good about what you do here, too. And sometimes you will, but often you will not. You need to know that. If you want to provide food for the hungry or build houses for the homeless and go home knowing that you help someone, there are a lot of great programs out there for you. If you want to be here, you have to carry the weight of your decisions and accept that there are situations you can't improve. It took years before I really got what she, she said. I went to law school because in 2002, the US asserted the power to detain enemy combatants without providing access to an attorney or any kind of process until the end of hostilities, meaning indefinitely. The idea of that kind of government power upset and terrified me enough that I decided to stop studying physics, apply to law school, and stick my fingers into whatever progressive social justice-oriented pies I could find. And there are a lot of pies. I got amazing opportunities to work with luminaries of the civil rights and public interest world. My bosses included Linus Chan, who would clerked for the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, which in the legal world means you can write your own ticket. <laughs> he was offered dozens of jobs with starting salaries of $170,000 a year and $60,000 in signing bonuses just for accepting the job. And despite triple-digit law school debt, Linus turned down those offers and took a job arguing with the folks at Immigration and Customs Enforcement for less than what a first-year school teacher makes. Once, during a prison visit, a detainee mistook me for him and asked, Hey, you that big Chino lawyer man from Chicago? I said, No, I'm Chino lawyer man number two. I also worked for Maria LaHood, lead counsel on Arar v. Ashcroft, the infamous extraordinary rendition case. Mar Maria had also turned down the big money. Early on in her career, she'd slept on her friend's couch, volunteered 50 hours a week at the New York Center for Constitutional Rights, and worked at a pizzeria at night for over a year before she finally got a paying job in civil rights. Finally, there was Joe Margulies, lead counsel on Razul v. Bush, a seminal 2004 Supreme Court case which established that prisoners in Guantanamo Bay are entitled to judicial, judicial review. The first time I saw Joe, he was giving a speech about his first trip to Guantanamo. He met with a client who absolutely did not trust him. Looked totally deflated, wouldn't meet his gaze. Interrogators often pretended to be attorneys or human rights monitors to fool detainees and crush their spirits, so his mistrust was not unwarranted. Joe introduced himself, explained who he was, what he was doing, then recited him a story. The story of the, how the client and his wife first met their first date. Joe knew that trust would be a problem. He'd sought out the client's wife for information that would help him convince the client that he was no cruel hoax. When the story was done, the client looked up and said, we've got a lot of work to do. I wanted that. There didn't seem to be any price I wouldn't pay for it. It'll be a lot of work. I'm ready for it. The salaries top out at $40,000 a year. I'll make do. The FBI will follow you around and scrutinize your every move, and conservatives will hate you and tell you that you're coddling terrorists and criminals. Bring it on. Law school will cost you $160,000. I winced. But thought, if that's the price you have to pay to live the life you want, to get to be a hero, I'm willing to pay it. But that's just not the way it works. Early in my legal career, a pair of siblings came to me in their mid-20s with a story and a lot of questions. Their father had gone to the DMV to renew his driver's license but never returned. The next time they heard from him, he was in an immigration and customs, customs enforcement detention center charged with an aggravated felony. See, 35 years earlier, when he was 20, he had had a 17-year-old girlfriend and did a brief stint in jail for a public indecency charge for having sex in his car. 
In Illinois, the age of consent is 17, so there is no statutory rape charge. However, under immigration law, sex with anyone under 17 constitutes sexual exploitation of a minor, regardless of that state's age of consent laws. Sexual exploitation of a minor is an aggravated felony, and anyone convicted of an aggravated felony is subject to mandatory detention and removal from the United States without any chance for asylum or of ever returning to the country. The Constitution expressly prohibits retroactive prosecution for acts that weren't crimes when they were committed, but that only covers criminal matters. Immigration is not considered a criminal, criminal matter, so Homeland Security can just go nuts on non-citizens. My new client was a legal permanent resident. He'd always lived and worked and traveled without restriction in the US, so he never po bothered to become a US citizen, and now he was fucked. I did everything I could for that family, but let them know up front that success was very unlikely. They did everything they could too. They brought me letters of support from the community, including one written in crayon by the client's six-year-old granddaughter begging the judge not to take her grandfather away and one from the family doctor explaining that the client's wife had limited mobility and relied on the client to help her get around. They even found the parents of the girl he had sexually exploited so many years ago who were all tears and apologies, explaining that they had only pressed the public indecency charge because they were angry that their daughter was having sex and would take it back now if they could. At the merits hearing, the immigration at attorney puffed up his chest in righteous indignation and talked about what a travesty it was that after we let him into this country and gave him a green card, he would betray the US by doing something so heinous as sexually exploiting a minor. I wanted to leap across the table and strangle him. Luckily, Linus was there, and Linus is a pro. That's why they call him the big Chino lawyer man. <laughs> he calmly and meticulously made all the arguments we'd prepared. Our client has had a spotless record for 35 years. He's raised three daughters and two sons without incident. He's no danger to anyone, and his removal would cause undue hardship on his wife, who depends on him. But we still lost. We lost a lot of cases like that, and it drove me nuts. I thought, after all the sacrifices we make, after all the work we do, don't we at least get to win? I was too young. Too impatient. I wanted to be Clarence Darrow or Thurgood Marshall, but I didn't want to spend years wading through the swamp of hopeless, unwinnable cases that Thurgood Marshall had to in order to set the stage for Brown v. Boards of Education. I wanted to be the victorious Thurgood Marshall, and I wanted to beat him right now. I grew increasingly embittered, and that bitterness manifested itself as anger towards my coworkers, classmates, and the people I was supposed to be helping until I realized that that career was not for me, not at that stage of my life. If I stayed, I'd only make myself and the people around me miserable. Worse, I'd take a job that might have gone to someone better suited, someone cool-headed and diligent, and so driven, she'd sleep on a friend's couch and work a second job at a pizzeria at night. At my last meeting with Joe, we talked about the apparent futility of our work, after all, no matter how many hours we put in, we'd never work ourselves out of a job. He noted that for all the years of work he'd done, none of his clients had been freed yet. He even bet one of my colleagues $50 that we would see a bill authorizing the indefinite detention of enemy combatants, whether Obama or anyone else became president. This was in 2008. He was proven right in 2001, or in 2011, with the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012 which not only authorizes, but mandates trial-free, indefinite detention for most suspected terrorists. Joe knew that all the work he'd done, the work he'd committed his life to, would be pushed back several years by ill-conceived le Ill legislation. He knew that a majority of the time he was just spinning his wheels, but he does it anyway. Marie and Linus, too. Even Thurgood Marshall. After the Supreme Court decided Brown v. Board, things didn't really change. Nothing changed for pe everyday people until a decade later when the Civil Rights Act gave the government the power to enforce desegregation. Joe, Maria, and Linus all work without the promise of ever affecting that kind of change. They seem to believe that these fights are worth having despite the losses, and they all understood implicitly what I couldn't grasp even when I was explicitly told so in no uncertain terms. This is not a soup kitchen. 
David Lynn. <laughs> <laughs>